Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Do you, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Um, before starting, I just wanted to ask you, now let's see if I manage, yes, just to see if this is all right. Here we are. Okay. Um, one second, just let's have this slightly more Yeah, okay. Um, before starting, I just wanted to ask you if you had any questions relating to the first, the, I mean, the, the lesson, yesterday's lesson, when I started discussing about um, uh, uh, private law and its uh, evolution, at least in the Western world. I'll just go back to the uh, Slides. There were very few slides that I, I sh showed to you. Um, sorry, just one second. Help. We started analyzing the relationship between economic systems and uh, uh, legal systems, and then we started looking at uh, uh, the sort of the, the role of uh, economic theory and uh, general philosophy of the law, Grotius, and uh, the influence of Descartes on the, or, in the sort of legal order in the continental Europe. And then we move slightly across the channel to look a little bit to what the, how the system started moving in, the, in that part of the world. Now, what I wanted to just to know if, uh, if there were any questions there, uh, just let me sh see this. I just like to make this slide. Okay. So 
So let's see, are there any questions? No questions? Okay, then we can start again and look at uh, and go on. Now, as I was mentioning, sorry, just a little share. Uh, I was just pointing out that the uh, the English system, and yeah, uh, Baker Wood obviously could, uh, uh, if he has any intervention, we will willingly uh, receive his intervention, his and of Albany Kids intervention um, on this topic. Um, well, while in the continental Europe, for us pro property is a notion which is very clear from Roman law, and it is an absolute right, in the English legal system, the notion of property right is any, any mm, situation which is legally protected that has a value, and uh, uh, therefore the notion of property right is not at all what we mean in continental Europe. When we talk of property, it can be in any material, non-material, it can be expectations, it's credits, and so on. So everything which is uh, of legal, uh, uh, of a certain value and has a legal, um, legal dimension in, uh, in the English and obviously also the US system is, uh, uh, is a property right. Now just to show you how the, the system, more or less how you can describe the system, I just want to show you this, this, uh, this drawing, very simple, drawing I, I just set out. Uh, we can imagine that if we put all property rights, all those situations which have a value, uh, an economic value, and are protected by the law, if we put them on an, uh, a sliding uh, slope, on a slope, we can see that we have some situations which have the maximum of value, and some which have less value. So we put them all, all on the same line, just knowing that uh, the value uh, of these various property rights changes. And how, why does it change? It changes, but these are functions that are related one to the other. First of all, the level of legal protection. To what extent your, uh, your value is protected? Is it protected? against only some individuals or against the world. So uh, what we generally in your European continent, we feel that, uh, I mean, absolute rights are absolute because they are protected against anybody who challenges those rights. When I own a land, a house, uh, some property, I protect it against anybody else and I'm protected, the law protects me against anybody else. While if I have a situation which is protected only uh, towards certain individuals, let's take typically uh, credit, a situation of credit, well, my legal protection is limited. If there's a third party that damages that credit, well, it is difficult for me to have protection. If I have, a, uh, if I have someone who must pay me some money and this person is unfortunately run over and killed, uh, by uh, in an accident, in a road accident, and therefore can no longer pay my credit, well, it is difficult to me to, to recover that, that credit. So that credit is protected only towards my debtor, not towards the rest of the world who may or may not interfere with my, with my credit. And so just to, in, if you look there uh, on this very simple, uh, drawing, we see that the value depends on the, what is the amount of legal protection. So uh, this is very important. So uh, we, the consistency, how, how important the right is, is also a function of the legal protection. And then the market value that moves from uh, one, just think of a mere expectation. I have bought uh, a lottery ticket and I have, uh, therefore I have an expectation to participate in a lottery, but someone destroys that, 
uh, lottery ticket. I have a mere expectation I might win if I participated in that in the lottery, but unfortunately I was ticket has been destroyed and therefore I cannot participate in that in that lottery. So that's a mere expectation. While an absolute right is considered an, a right which has a maximum level of protection and therefore has a high market value. So just to point out, if we try to look at uh, private law um, situations, situations obviously of relationships between, uh, between uh, um, uh, private individuals and we see them through the lenses of economy, which is not the only, there are many other aspects that are worth considering. Well, we, uh, we can see that uh, we can give, uh, we can somehow place in a certain order the various legal situations. Now, just to go on on this, uh, uh, analysis of private law, um, looking at therefore the law in the economic system, uh, private law is generally not only, but generally seen as the instrument to protect and enforce economic interest of private individuals and entities. Uh, it is surely a relationship between uh, private individuals and therefore, when it comes to the relationship between an individual and the state, uh, we have a different kind of relationship. But generally speaking, you must always consider that the law has always a certain amount of, and legal systems have an, uh, serious, uh, considerable areas, gray areas of uncertainty, of, which are misty. Uh, but generally speaking, on the whole, private law is seen as the instrument to protect economic and enforce, protect and enforce uh, economic interests. So if we look at private law from the lenses of economy, I repeat, not the only lenses that you can use, uh, well, what do we find? Well, let's look at typical partitions. Uh, partitions that generally find, uh, anybody finds studying, uh, uh, going to a law school, whether you go to law school in Italy, in Belgium, in uh, England or the US, you will generally find these partitions of private law. Uh, property, uh, obviously we're looking at what values are we looking? Ownership, so who, entitlement. They're not exactly the same thing, but this gives you the idea of the, that property can mean many, many aspects uh, because I have ownership of a house, but I am entitled to a credit. So if I have the notion of property, uh, and I, when I have a property of a credit, I'm entitled to that credit, and therefore I can obtain the payment of that credit by my debtor. Possession, what do you mean by possession? So what are the faculties that are given to the, uh, those who hold a, a certain object? I possess uh, my watch, and therefore I can use it, and I can exchange it, I can lend it, and I can... Uh, do many kinds of uh, uses. And then what is very important from an economic point of view, the exchange and use value, because any situation, uh, whether it is material or non-material, has both an exchange, so how much do I, if I sell, if I trade, if I transfer this, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this right, uh, what uh, do I obtain? from an economic point of view, and what in, is the value which I obtain if I use, use this, uh, this entity, this right. I own a house, I can sell this house, that's fine. I can rent this house and therefore I'm paid rent, or I can use the house, that means I, I save rent. If I rented my house, I would get 1,000 euros per month. If I use it myself, that means I'm saving 1,000 euros per month. Just to show you that all these economic uh, principles are somehow included in the notion of property, and we study this when we look at property, both if we look at property from uh, a strictly um, uh, Roman law tradition, or we look at it from a more English-British common law uh, tradition, looking at uh, 
uh, property in the sense of property on over physical objects and on immovables. Uh, so these are the main economic aspects. If we look at contract instead, we see the contracts is there to protect the um, economic, sorry, there's a typo here, if you, I'll just correct it immediately. Economic transactions, which cannot be based exclusively on trust. Uh, clearly, in the best of the worlds, well, trust will, can work very well. I trust someone and I lend money or this person promises that uh, I, if I give some money to that person, that person will do perform some kind of service. But trust is good and generally works in, <clears throat> in relationships, but you cannot, uh, trust by itself is not sufficient in complex societies in very big and large and distributed on the territory societies. So uh, what do we have? Contract is uh, the instrument, the legal instrument through which you can obtain judicial enforcement of promises. I have uh, promised to sell you uh, a car for 5,000 euros. Uh, obviously this um, exchange and you have promised 5,000 euros for my car. In these promises, they are, if they are not respective, if I don't hand over the car or you don't give me the 5,000 euros, well, there will be judicial enforcement of that, uh, of that, <clears throat> um, of that uh, promise. But if I simply say, well, if you, if I tell my son, well, listen, if you behave, if you get a good mark uh, at your, um, at your, when you graduate, I will, I will make a present to you, I'll give you a car. Well, we can discuss if it is a legally binding <clears throat> promise and if actually, if I am uh, obliged to give a car, and what kind of car, can I get, give him a used car, second-hand car, or must I give him a, a, new, uh, a new, new, new car, new BMW? So just to point out that it's, uh, um, it contract is the, instrument, the legal instruments for which uh, economic uh, uh, activities are uh, conducted and next to contract, because contract brings with it the problem of enforcement, we have what the Americans call collaterals. Uh, they just stop there. I've just said that these are collaterals are collateral system of guarantees and securities. In order to be sure that someone performs his or her obligation, I want a guarantee. This guarantee can be a pledge. They hand me a diamond ring or, and I hold, I keep in pledge this diamond ring until performance of the contract has been made or it could be a bank guarantee. I, if uh, the person does not pay me, well, I go to the bank and ask the bank to pay me. So just to point out that contract has a whole lot of collateral aspects which are very important from an economic point of view and modern economy is based greatly on contracts and collaterals. Uh, there's also another aspect, extra contractual liability, which in uh, English in England, in the UK and America called torts, uh, and which is a typical part of the, uh, when students study private law, well, the, the, the main issue is we have someone who has suffered a damage and who should bear this damage? Uh, someone has, uh, um, Laurie has gone into someone's car and destroyed the wall. Uh, someone has been run over. Uh, someone has been, uh, his personal data has been uh, disseminated uh, medical data has been disseminated in, in the public or uh, someone goes to the hospital and is falls in the hospital. Uh, so the problem of extra contractual liability, which is a very important aspect in both theoretical uh, private law but in practical uh, private law is, uh, is it possible and to what extent transfer the damage on someone else? So if someone suffers a damage 
must this damage uh, lie where uh, it happened? So the person who has suffered a damage, uh, uh, that's his fault. I mean, if, if someone is walking on the, uh, on the, uh, in the, on the street and a dead bird falls and hits this person and this person is uh, hurt or uh, their bird droppings, well, uh, the damage and the suit, the new suit is get ruined. Obviously, there's no, there's no, um, there's no way of getting, of recovering that damage. But otherwise, the main issue is <coughs> that of understanding who will pay. So is it the wrongdoer? Just imagine that someone with a car runs over a pedestrian and therefore the wrongdoer is the, uh, the, the driver and therefore it, uh, one will act, the pedestrian will take, uh, ask that his damage, his or her damage is um, uh, indemnified by the driver. But let's imagine that the driver is not is a driver of a company and the car belongs to a certain company could it be that the liability is of the employer of the wrongdoer and therefore the employer of the of the uh, driver has to pay for that damage or just think of the case of a defective product uh, there is some kind of product which has uh, an automobile has a defective product this defective product uh, determines that the car goes out of his way and hurts some pedestrians, can these pedestrians act as it's not the fault of the driver because that was quite unexpected and it was not under the control of the driver, but it is the fault of the producer of the car. Can those pedestrians ask damages to, um, to the uh, producer of the defective food? Or last resort, can you go to the state and ask the state to pay for damages? Typical example, terrorist attack, people are killed in this terrorist attack. Can the parents of the people who were killed act against the state and say, listen, you should have protected, you didn't introduce sufficient uh, measures to protect the public from terrorist attacks. You should somehow uh, pay uh, the damages or somehow indemnified damages suffered. So if you look at this from a, uh, from a very economic perspective, you see that tort law, extra contractual liability has to do with allocation of damages. Where do we allocate damages? On the person who has suffered, person or entity which has suffered the damage, or should it be transferred to somebody else, to some other entity? So this, as you see, it is, has to do, these rules have to do with economics and with distribution of wealth. Again, if we always look at, you know, typical partitions of, uh, of, uh, of uh, private law, we generally consider that family law is part of private law because it is their legal relationships that are between individuals. But uh, we tend to maybe to look only at those non-material relations, love, affection, which are lead, then become legally binding. Two people uh, are in love with each other, which, uh, with each other. they want to somehow uh, consolidate their, uh, their staying together and they give it a legal, uh, a legal vestment and therefore they get married. But that is one aspect, surely very important, the basis of, of, uh, of this kind of union. But there are many, if we look at family law, we see an increasing, an enormous amount, not increasing, an enormous amount of uh, economic aspects. First of all, uh, the um, patrimonial aspects during marriage, when uh, the, the couple buys a house, does this house belong to both of them or is, does it belong only to the person who put the money there? So the problem of common uh, estate or separate estates, which is a very important issue in family law. And also after, when there's a dissolution of marriage, what happens if the one, one spouse must pay the other uh, some alimony to maintain uh, the other uh, the 
other spouse. So if you look at the family law, again, we see that family law is very, has very much to do with the regulation of economic interest in a certain way between uh, the members of a family. And uh, even more, obviously, when it comes to succession, the, all the rules in the field of succession, whether we are talking of interstate succession, that is succession where there is not a will, or the cases where there is a will, what we are talking succession law is about the intergenerational transmission of wealth. So again, we bring it, it comes down to uh, economic aspects. Now, why I wanted to uh, point out this, this, uh, this stressed uh, economic aspect of private law, because if we, uh, uh, I started from the premise that uh, uh, the law is strongly influenced by um, economic factors, and therefore private law is strongly influenced by the economic environment and the context in which uh, those, those, uh, those rules uh, are in force. Just, just things are not exactly the same. Not all countries are the same. Just think of the fact of uh, who owns the house in which they live. Now, this is very common in certain countries among which Italy, it is less common in other countries. So the problem of the property of, uh, of um, the house, of a house, is something which somehow influences uh, the economic system because obviously house owners are very important, have a very important role, and therefore if they're the majority of the population, they tend to protect and they want that the law protects their <clears throat> main, most important asset of their estate, while if instead the people are not really <clears throat> so much, then not the uh, ownership of the one's own house is not so common, let's say it's only a quarter of the population, the rest of the people rent their house, obviously they will be much more interested in protecting people who rent a house rather than the protection of those who own a house. So just to point out that the economic system, the economics of, uh, of, uh, uh, of personal relations have a very important uh, uh, influence on private law. And therefore, when we look at the differences in private law, we have to consider what is the economic background. For example, why in Italy very few people do a will uh, for when they die, because they feel that on the whole, what is the, uh, the default rule set out in the civil code, it, well, it, it's sufficiently which guarantees uh, uh, the widow, uh, the surviving spouse, uh, or, and the children, well, they think this is, uh, this is quite enough and there's no need to make, to make it to do something that is different. So just to point out that we have to also look at uh, traditions and, uh, and uh, economic, normal economic relations between individuals and how individuals behave in the economic arena. Now, what I would like to point out is, and I will return to this point, is that the strengths of private law, strengths means the effectiveness of, uh, of private law, the fact that it is uh, important in a society is very dependent on the rules of procedure and the available instruments of enforcement. The fact that they are, <coughs> it is possible to enforce. You have a private law right, and if that right is not respected, uh, whether it is a property right or it is a liability, uh, something that comes from liability uh, of relationship, uh, someone has provoked a damage uh, to someone else, well, whatever, or someone has not fulfilled the contract, what, what extent there is, there is legal protection by the courts and by the, by the procedural system. And here, please keep in mind, obviously, our uh, British students know this very well because it is something that is at the basis of the English uh, common law and also the US common law, 
remedies precede rights. So you will say that a right is very strong if there are very strong remedies. If the remedies are not very effective, your right is purely nominal. This is why in this, in the, this very small, uh, this very simple uh, graphic I made, I, I put here legal protection. The more the legal protection, the more the right is considered very strong and is more valuable. So, but if it is, the legal protection is low, well, then the value of that right is much, uh, much lower. Uh, so just keep in mind this idea that in certain systems, the idea that remedies precede rights, or at any rate, a right depends, its consistency depends uh, significantly on, uh, on what are the available remedies and how effective they are. And this is something I tell, I must stress with our Italian students who are doing their first year of university and this semester they are studying private law. Just keep in mind the studying uh, substantive private law and the basic principles of private law. Just keep in mind that substantive law and procedural law, something that they will study further on in the, in the third year they will start be studying procedural law are two faces of the same coin. So in a coin, you can't, you have a euro in your pocket and you can't divide one, uh, one face of the, of the coin from the other. The two aspects are together and give you the idea of what a private law system is. If you forget, if you look only at the, at the, at the substantive aspect, aspect of what you're studying this semester, and you forget the procedural, you ignore the procedural aspect, or vice versa. If you know only the procedural aspect and you ignore the private, the substantive aspect, you are having, you are having nothing. You have nothing in your hand. It's if you had half a euro, half, well, only one face of the euro, which is not worth anything and you can't spend it anywhere, not even in an automatic vending machine. So just to keep in mind uh, this. And uh, now, just before, sorry. Now, just I just want you to see: are there any are there any questions on this first part um, on this first part of the of the lesson? Sorry, just let me. If there are any, any questions, issues, Oh, okay. Apparently everything is clear, so we can go back to our slides. I'm going to move to something. So, let's always looking at the law and the economic system we see that uh, over the last two centuries at least, most economic activities are put in place not by individuals. Clearly there are individuals who are very, very wealthy. Just think of a, a famed lawyer, a practicing lawyer, or a famed uh, doctor, uh, or, but generally speaking, most activities, or a, a, an artist, just think of, a, of someone who is, uh, uh, a, a great uh, conductor uh, orchestra or a, a musician who does concerts uh, well but generally speaking most economic activity is put into place not by individual but by companies I just would like to remind 
you because, well, uh, our foreign students, this is important for them, but at the same time, it's also important for our Italian students to remember that company comes from compagnia, compagnia, which was the basic instrument in which in medieval Tuscany, uh, um, a certain amount of people joined together, especially for trading activity, and compagnia is this, uh, is its etymological uh, origin means kumpan, and they share with bread, they bread sharing. So the idea is that this bread means obviously a profit, and uh, uh, from your activity, and that you share your uh, your profit. So these elements <coughs> are very important, and I will return to the issue of medieval medieval Tuscany because it is one of the um, sort of of the birthplaces of modern of modern capitalism. So um, just uh, um, what. Uh, uh, I would like to show, point out is that starting from the Middle Ages, the legal entities uh, have a, um, a role in the law and in business activities. Uh, as I've already mentioned yesterday, while natural persons exist of physical persons, and then we can discuss about their legal position. They could be slaves, and therefore they have no right, they're simply property, but they are individuals, or we could have limitations in uh, their legal capacity. Uh, obviously, infants have a, a limitation legal capacity, and until, um, well, uh, last century, the uh, sorry, the 19th century, there were very strong limitations on women's uh, legal capacity, but legal entities do not exist. They're not uh, are made of bones and flesh. They are a legal entity. They exist only because the law says they exist. Uh, our Italian students will find when they study this, they will find the issue of what a condominium is. The, this this entity, is it a legal entity? Yes, uh, but what is its role in the uh, legal system uh, when it comes to uh, paying debts of the uh, building, the condominium uh, orders certain works to be done in the building, who pays if the condominium does not pay, who pays for those, uh, for those uh, uh, for the, those expenses. So, but legal entities, to return to the issue, legal entities exist only in the law and as much as the law allows them and uh, it, in, to the extent that the law allows them to do this or not to do that. So just to point out that this is a very, uh, obviously a, uh, an abstract uh, entity and therefore it depends on the law. And obviously the law is our business. So we see the legal entities, these abstract figures, which are have a growing importance in the field of the economy and therefore also of the law. And the legal entity is seen as, or we call it a legal entity because it is an entity for the law, as a center of patrimonial interest. It has a uh, patrimony, uh, it has the ability to entertain uh, contractual relations. It has liability towards third uh, parties. It could be contractual liability, but it could be also be extra contractual liability. An example I've made of the uh, automobile or the van of a company which runs over a pedestrian. It will be surely the, 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 the driver is liable, but the, the damage will be paid by the company. So what is the these legal entities gradually, very gradually, from the Middle Ages onwards, they are, uh, we have a separation from the legal entity and the persons that are behind it. Um, so we tend to not to identify the legal entity with the people who have founded this legal entity, which own this legal entity, but we tend to separate them very slowly, not immediately, we tend to separate those, the legal entity, 
as a center of legal relations from uh, the persons who have created this legal entity, are managing this legal entity, are own this legal entity. Uh, so uh, what happens, just to show how the development of the system works, we have in the Middle Ages, we see the birth of this first capitalism, it's called proto-capitalism. Uh, because for a business endeavor, you need workforce, obviously you need people who work, who are creating, they must be, they are producing goods, they might be textiles, they might be pottery, they might be uh, uh, fine uh, pieces of jewelry, uh, and uh, you need people who s transport this, they transfer these goods from one market to another, and then people who sell it, then you need obviously goods. If you don't have goods, you can't buy or sell, but then you need financial capital. This is why we call it capitalism, because the, one of the main elements of this business endeavor is the fact that you need capital. You need money to uh, credit, money as cash or credit uh, to run this activity. And so what happens and here again, we look at Tuscany as the birthplace of this uh, capitalistic society. We see that the birth of banks. And we, when we think of the first bankers, obviously we think of the Medicis, who are bankers and then become the rulers of, of, uh, of, uh, of Florence. So just to point out that the, you see that this in this, uh, we're talking of something that happens more or less seven, eight, eight, seven, eight centuries ago, we see how capitalism grows in a certain part of Italy, which is the first to develop a certain kind of industry of uh, economic activity and of industrial activity, especially with the production of uh, cloths, uh, of textiles, which are then exported in the rest of Europe. And the fact that the, next to this, uh, with this economic uh, uh, activity, they need other, they need financial institutions. Uh, well, obviously, uh, they invent that those ages. What do you invent? You invent letters of credit, typically, promissory notes. So the typical instruments of credit, which are made to have credit and also to transfer money from one part of another. We have a whole lot of archives that show us that uh, uh, these rich merchants, Florentine merchants and uh, Flemish merchants who were equally very developed in their trade were exporting and they didn't bring money with them. It would have been very dangerous at those times, but used brought pieces of paper and these pieces of paper were presented to a bank and the bank on the basis of this uh, promissory note or this letters of credit open gave cash to the person who was presented this uh, piece of paper. So just to show you how important the relationship between uh, the um, development of trade in Europe in the Middle Ages and development of, uh, of uh, financial institutions. Now, what is the main limit of this proto-capitalistic uh, system is that generally, not always, uh, there's this principle of unlimited liability. So those who operate a uh, uh, business activity, or even if they do it under compagnia, under company, they are liable, unlimitedly liable with all their, um, uh, with all their uh, wealth. Here we have uh, um, I'll just write it down a second uh, because probably you will find this. Let's see if I find my whiteboard.
this medieval institution of Komenda, which really comes from, uh, we discover, we find it in the Arab world in the more or less in the 10th century, uh, development of uh, trade in that part of the world is um, moves before uh, the northern part of the of Europe. I mean, northern Mediterranean, Italy, because of a certain series of circumstances, and we find legal institutions uh, which uh, somehow uh, which uh, are similar to this institution of the commenda. We find the equivalent, and I'm just telling this to our Italian students, uh, um, we find, they will find this when they will study um, this, the, this notion of a comandica. What happens in the commenda, in the medieval commenda? Let me just move back to the slides. Um, Sorry. What happens in this, uh, in the uh, commenda? That there are two kinds of, uh, of members of this company. Members who manage the company and who are um, uh, so putting the money in the company and who are those who manage the company are unlimitedly liable and instead uh, members of the company who are simply putting money but do not manage the company. Therefore, they have no role in the management. So they have a limited liability. But this is a very rudimental, a very primitive form of uh, what will, will be required. So the turning point in uh, is the fact that uh, this, this uh, great uh, event, which is the discovery of America, of the new world, um, determines in 1492, determines the development of very uh, increasingly uh, developed uh, engine, nautical engineering, that is building ships, First ships were mostly used in the Mediterranean, therefore, for the kind of, uh, of uh, use that had to be done in the Mediterranean, which is, can be a nasty sea, but it is a small sea uh, on the whole. For, uh, instead, ships that had to go across the Atlantic, a long, very long trip, and uh, without seeing any land, and then moving on to other parts of the world. So what happens is that at this point, we have this new world that is discovered, and there is this, with these new ships, you can move, you can go also other parts of the world, typically what was known at those times as the place where uh, the most wealth was, uh, was the richness was, that is the Indies. So, and in fact, we call the British call the East Indies, that is India, and the West Indies, and that is the West Indies, are obviously the Caribbean islands and all the rest of the New World. So uh, when we have these, uh, uh, the possibility to, uh, to put into place economic activity that must trade, must produce goods, must collect goods that come in, that are come from these distant parts of the world, obviously you need a different kind of uh, economic organization and a different notion of company. Why? Because these, uh, this trading with the new world, trading with the Indies is risky, very risky. Obviously we have wars, wars between countries, so at a certain point wars between Spain and England and Obviously, a British ship is seized by a uh, Spanish fleet and vice versa. Then you have pirates, and obviously pirates are present uh, all in all seas. Storms, hurricanes, typhoons, and this are and these ships are difficult to, uh, they're not very resistant. They are not, they cannot flee from these 
uh, unexpected uh, the possibility to know what there's no meteorological satellite that tells them that the hurricane is going to come along and so it is very dangerous uh, to go about and then epidemics uh, on board uh, which uh, uh, killed the crew so it is a very risky activity so they these these uh, business endeavors need uh, need um, uh, uh, to have a very big amount of capital, which is not the capitals that uh, two or few individuals can uh, can uh, put together, but you need lots of money that is put in this uh, in this activity. So you must raise enormous amount of capital for these risky activities. And what do we have? We have the birth date of modern company, as I already mentioned, the year 1600, Queen Elizabeth uh, I, obviously the great, uh, grants a charter to the East India Company. It's called in a slightly different name, but we will, um, it is, we'll see it in a moment, which is one of the first and surely the most successful limited liability shareholder companies. I will return to this in a moment. I'll just give you now a short, um, let's see if I can show you this, this very short, oh, two minutes of a video. It's a much longer video, but uh, mm, let's see if I can. If you If I manage to, probably it's loading it. Sorry, one second. The East India Company, originally chartered as the governor and company of merchants of London trading into the East Indies, and more properly called the Honourable East India Company, was in England. Sorry, just let's, let's go back again. I'll just give you the link and then everybody can, if they want, they can go there. Uh, now, let's go back to the slides. 
the whole idea is this that um, what the, um, this East India Company is created to collect the capital necessary to uh, to have uh, um, uh, to conduct uh, uh, business activities in East India. Now, what is interesting is that the company is given a monopoly in trade with that part of the world. And therefore, it's, it's extremely profitable, like all monopolistic activities. And therefore, everybody runs to put their money in the East India Company uh, because it, is, uh, it has a monopoly over the trade, typically whether we're talking of textiles, jewelry, um, uh, drugs, uh, perfumes, and uh, uh, other um, uh, valuable uh, goods that come, are come from that part of the world not only India, geographically India, but also other parts of the, of the, of the East. And so it is extremely uh, profitable and everybody all, and as I've mentioned uh, yesterday, the, um, the, uh, the, those, the shareholders of this, uh, of this East India company are not only uh, traders, but also noblemen, British noblemen who have money, plenty of money and want to put their money into this business activity. If you look at, uh, if you go around England and you look at these wonderful mansions that are created mostly in the end of the 17th century and in the 18th century, most of these, the money that were used, enormous amounts of money that were used to build these wonderful palaces and mansions uh, around uh, England come from uh, trading from with the, uh, with India uh, and the Far East. Uh, so let's go back to the uh, to the legal aspect. What is particular in this? Uh, first of all, I mentioned that is uh, uh, the first it, one of the first. We have also the example of the Dutch East India Company, but as we are more interested in the English East India Company because it lasted so long, it lasted till the end of the 19th century and had an enormous role in the, in the uh, development of India at a certain point until substantially from the mid 18th century to the mid 19th century, the East India Company, a private company controlled India, had uh, uh, the army, uh, its own army, its own police, its own courts, had was a sort of a company that controlled this vast, vast territory, although having to uh, negotiate its uh, relations with the local uh, sovereign, uh, various sovereigns around India. So uh, we are looking at the uh, uh, East India Company because it is the example of the first limited liability uh, shareholder company. So first of all, what happens is that you uh, you enter a company, you participate in a company through a share. A share is a fraction, and but it is obviously a nominal fraction, and it is a purely uh, theoretical uh, indication. It could be one tenth, one one thousand, one of, out of ten thousand, one out of a million. So the problem is, what is your share? So this is the first point. Is uh, uh, while in the Compania, the medieval Compania, we are talking of not more than, you know, 10, 15 people. Here we're talking of thousands and thousands of, uh, of uh, people who hold a share of the East India Company. The second element, it is a limited liability. So here we see the separation, the very clear separation between the, the what happens to the legal entity its, uh, uh, its successes, its failures, and the position of the single individual who has put money as bought the shares. So the investors, that they can be single individuals, they can be also other, they could be banks, contribute to the capital of the company by buying shares. The, why do they buy their sh these shares? Because these shares yield a dividend. The dividend is the interest which is paid at the end of the year on the basis of the 
of the of the on the basis of the profits of their net profits of their company and are subdivided in uh, according to the amount of shares one holds if i hold one percent of the shares of a company well then there is i have the right to uh, to obtain uh, to have one percent of the net profits of the of the company so just to point out that this is the uh, the, uh, the reason why people put money in the in the uh, in buy shares of the company but at the same time they run a risk surely they are risky adventures uh, because they can be a war they can be uh, pirates they can be a whole lot of various unforeseen circumstances that uh, uh, destroy the, the profit of their company that make this company go uh, not have a profit or you uh, the company loses so much that it loses all its capital and therefore goes bankrupt but in that case the um sorry there's a typo here bankruptcy there's an r that is lacking sorry Uh, so when the company goes bankrupt, if it closes because it has so much, these losses are beyond its financial ability to repay the debts. Well, the um, the liability of the individual is limited. That's why we call it the limited liability to the shares they own. They lose their shares. They've made an investment you lose your investment, but all the rest of your assets of your estate is safe. So if, and here, obviously you manage your wealth and you distribute like uh, when you have, you don't put, as the uh, popular saying says, you don't put all your eggs in the same basket, but you put your eggs in various baskets. So if one basket falls, the other basket should be, remain uh, intact and you can have you can uh, hatch an egg from those other eggs, uh, uh, a hen from those other eggs. So just to point out that the, uh, the, the importance of introducing this notion of limited liability of a company, which is now is the main aspect of uh, company law. Obviously, we still have different kinds of companies, but generally speaking, we have um, we have these uh, limited liability companies, which are those which uh, control contemporary modern economy. Now, uh, so what happens? There's this clear legal separation. Legal means that the law establishes that there's a separation between the legal entity, the company, and its owners, the shareholders. So the creditors of the legal entity, if they are not paid by the legal entity, cannot go to the shareholder saying, hey, listen, Mr. Shareholder, as you are the owner of the company, you're owner for 1%, for 10%, you will pay your amount, you will pay the debts of the company. No, they are completely separated. So uh, this is the first separation. The second separation also is very important, is a legal separation between the legal entity and which is the company and those who operate on its behalf. That is the managers are the managers of the company. They are agents of the company. They are not the company itself and therefore are not, unless they have conducted uh, their activity in a uh, uh, completely violating the rules, violating the laws, they are not liable for the losses of the company. Of the company. So if a company goes, uh, goes bankrupt, uh, they are uh, the, the the managers. If they've operated, just think of a company that is uh, uh, in this uh, predicament of the of the situation of the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic, and the company uh, is uh, I put all my there's a manager of a hotel, and the hotel closes for one month, two months, and has no money 
no money. The, well, the manager is not fault of the manager. The creditors of the hotel cannot go to the manager of the of the of the hotel saying you must pay the debts. The manager say I'm an agent of the hotel company. Uh, four four seasons. Let's call it four seasons. Uh, uh, chain of hotels, company of hotels, and the manager is the agent of the company is distinct from the legal entity which is the company. Further, very important uh, aspect is that at this point when we have these shares that are uh, a, a legal fiction which are created by the law, a participation in the capital of a company which is gives you the right to receive a dividend a dividend in the amount of the of the uh, in the amount of the monies or the profits of the company well what uh, uh, this these shares become a typical financial instrument which is traded in the sense that these they are traded and they have a value in itself. They are not necessarily their face value, but their market value. So the share says one share of the East India Company. It obviously it is traded on the stock market on the basis of its market value. How uh, do we establish uh, the market value? Generally, establish it on what are the expectations of a dividend. So you expect that that company will give a dividend at the end of the year, will give a dividend of 5% of 10% and therefore uh, over the face value of the share and therefore you are expecting a, a good dividend or they might be a, a loss and therefore you will, uh, the, therefore there will be no dividend and therefore and no dividend is expected for the following years and therefore the value of the shares are uh, diminishes. So the fact that you have this new tradable commodity which are shares, non-material uh, credits, pieces, uh, uh, credits over the future dividends of a company uh, brings to the birth of uh, stock markets. Places where shares which originally are pieces of paper, now in contemporary times are simply digitalized, are bought and sold. So this is very important to show how uh, we have companies and companies, company law means a whole lot of other aspects. It's not only regulating <coughs> the relationship between shareholders and the company, company and third parties, but also creating a new legal environment in which stock markets are a fundament, fundamental aspect. Now, here we see, and this is why it's so interesting from a, from a, a comparative perspective, we have two models. It isn't that these limited liability uh, shareholder companies are exclusive of, of uh, uh, England. We find them already in, in the Netherlands, that is on the European continent, and then now we find them all around the world. But we find substantially two models, two economic models for which you finance a company. Uh, a modern company, modern mean from the East India Company onwards, a company needs capital because we are a capitalistic society that is a society in which capital has plays such an important role in financing, uh, in financing investment for new activities or for renovating old activities. Anyhow, capitals, um, companies always need capital uh, for investment, for credit, for their various activities. We have two economic models, which are the Anglo-American model, which we will see in a moment, and the so-called Rhine model. Rhine following the notion of the idea of the, the, the geographical uh, of the river Rhine. Now let's look at the Anglo-American model, which is very important 
but it is, uh, and we shall see to what extent it is different from the continental European model. And this shows us why I'm stressing so much the relationship between law and economic system. Because if the economic system is structured in a certain way, the law inevitably will have to follow that economic system, uh, support that economic system. Otherwise, it doesn't work. The economic system does not work and is not favored by the law. Now, let's look at the fundamentals of the the Anglo-American model. So, in the Anglo-American model, when a business endeavor needs capital in order to develop its activity, it goes public. I just tell this to our um, Italian students and to our Belgian students, uh, uh, when in, uh, in English, and especially the US, you talk of a public company, it doesn't mean that it is a company owned by the state. In this sense, the idea that it's public, it belongs to the public authority. No, a public company in the language, company in the legal language of the US and of uh, the UK is a company that has sells its shares to the general public, to the public at large. That is because you can have shares which are not tradable. I have a company and I and my family own the shares of, the, of, the, uh, of that company. It is a private company. The shares are private. They, are not, they cannot be traded. Uh, they cannot be sold and probably there's a clause by which the members of the family, if they want to sell these shares to someone else, they must first give the first choice to members of the family. So, what we're talking about are public companies. So those companies in which the shares are put on the public market, on the stock market, and can be sold to the public at large. So just to cl clarify certain terms, otherwise there can be some misunderstanding, especially our first year uh, Italian students uh, might think that when you speak of a public company, in you're thinking of a, of a company which is owned by the state. That is not at all the case. A public company is a company which has share, shares which are sold at, to anybody of the public. Now, what further element? We have, as shares are sold to the public at large, and therefore they're sold and become tradable commodities, which can be bought or sold, we have these stock markets. A market where instead of selling uh, cows, uh, corn, uh, um, cheese or wine, oil, you're, we are selling pieces of paper at that time which represent the share that you have in a certain company. Now these stock markets are what we call informational markets. That is markets which are driven by the uh, information that you have on the company, what the company has been doing, uh, what it belongs, what it owns, sorry, what are its previous balance sheets, what are its prospects. For example, if we know that an oil company has done, been doing some research and has found an oil bed somewhere, these, this, uh, uh, and that from which he can extract uh, with not too much cost, a uh, uh, considerable amount of oil, well, the shares of that company will increase immediately. If now uh, a pharmaceutical company says it has discovered a vaccine against the coronavirus and now it is testing it, it has experimented it successfully and now is uh, working uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, patent this vaccine, well, the shares of that uh, company will increase uh, considerably. So you see these are, when we talk of informational markets, markets in which information is 
uh, essential because the information you dispose of are uh, the basis of the value you give to the shares of a certain uh, company. And uh, as we are talking of stock markets and the fact that this money comes uh, goes to the companies through stock markets, you must protect the trust in the market, in the stock market. So you must be very sure that uh, what is sold on the stock market, in the stock market, is uh, uh, what exactly it is meant to be. Uh, yesterday, when we were analyzing the uh, birth of independent agencies, and I explained why the Security Exchange Commission uh, was born, it was because New York Stock Exchange was substantially unregulated, uncontrolled, and anyone selling products, shares, or companies did not exist, saying that they were extremely profitable and said that they were scams, they were a system of probably stealing money from, from business. And so what you need, you need a very strong and efficient system of the controls information. You must ensure that information that is provided to market is trustworthy, is correct, is clear. It is very interesting between what is a fact and what is an expectation, what is an asset in its value today, and what are the expectations of profit tomorrow. So all this information is very important and when you will study a uh, uh, company law and how the market works, well, you see this, this has very much to do with the Role of information in the of information passes from one moment to another. So, if suddenly, just let's imagine that somebody comes out and uses it, uh, uh, that uh, there has been uh, an outbreak that the coronavirus is controlling security in the US, you will immediately see the New York Stock Exchange or they know to be production, production of production of goods, etc. So, so, on. so, immediately, one second, they will know, you will see a, a Dow Jones index, which index what is called the value which is put in the New York Stock Exchange, how it falls down. So, this gives you the idea of what we mean by informational market. Now, so wh how, what is the system? And I will try to close on this very simple uh, model. So uh, obviously in the Anglo-American model, as the investors buy the shares of the company, uh, well, that's how the company finds its money and banks, mostly banks, what do they do? They, banks and asset management funds, uh, invest in companies in order to receive a dividend. So the money has, the bank has certain amount of money because people have deposited money in the bank and the bank says, well, how do I make, uh, how do I make a dividend? Well, I will invest this money in companies which I select. I will select these companies and I will provide, I will, provide money, but buying shares of these companies. Not giving money to the company itself, but buying shares of the company. So the model which you see of the Anglo-American model is this. There's a company, the company issues shares, and these shares are sold on the stock market. These shares are bought by individual investors. They could be most Americans Generally, what Americans, they, what they generally do, private wealth is uh, managed directly or sometimes through wealth. It is very wealthy through wealth managers, but uh, families in the U.S. buy shares. It could be Apple, Google, General Motors, whatever, General Electric. They will, they will buy, uh, they will be buy shares and expect dividend. Or they may be bought uh, by investment institutions which put their money and buy shares, and at the end of the year, shareholders are awarded with a dividend if obviously the uh, company has been profitable. So this is the Anglo-American model, we will see also two other important aspects, but this is an idea of that, uh, uh, the, how the system works. We have an economic system, a capitalistic system, in its neutral its definition, it is a capitalistic economic system because it requires capital. How does it obtain capitals if uh, they are individuals or entities that have financial resources, that have money, they want to invest this money, they don't want to keep this money under the mattress or keep it in the safe, and they want to basically make some kind of profit out of this money, uh, and they, how do they do They buy shares. So we see that uh, when savings go towards uh, investment in companies, and therefore people are saving money, put their money in shares, and try to expect to obtain a certain amount of a, a dividend of the share. They're still holders of a 
the Swiss pay, which they trade, if they're not satisfied with everybody, if they say, they say, well, we better move out the tourism and, and the hotel industry and transport industry, aviation, civil aviation industry, because there's a stress. Let's move, put all the money in the They will sell the shares of these companies, tourism, hotel companies, restaurant companies, uh, uh, airline companies, and we'll buy shares of the main, of the main pharmaceutical companies, hoping that some of these, one of these companies will come up with the uh, vaccine against coronavirus. So, see, one asset, which is the the share you hold, the share depends on the, its market value and obviously on the expectation of the dividend. So this is the Anglo-American uh, model. And just to point out that this is how the system works and how money goes from uh, private individuals and entities towards uh, economic enterprises and how they, these, uh, uh, these companies uh, finance themselves in a new uh, investment activities. So this is uh, the basic model. Now I want you to see if there are um, any questions on this part, this, uh, this lesson. No questions? Hear me? Uh, who is speaking? Uh, Ricardo Zinai. Zinai, yes. Can you raise a little bit the microphone, the volume of your microphone? Um, how do you do this? Um, well, you should have it on your. You should have it on your control. You should look at. Uh, maybe it's, it's, your, it's your computer. You just have the volume. Okay. Of, uh, it should be on your keyboard. Your keyboard has uh, has a a, a mute uh, a mute uh, key and then. Uh, and then uh, plus and minus. Or you speak very loudly. Speak loudly, Zinai, and I hope everybody hears you. Uh, okay, um, so could you tell us something about the Rhine model instead? The? Uh, the, the other model for... No, well, well, this is, no, this will come uh, next week, sorry. It's, uh, I haven't yet finished the Anglo-American model. There are still some very important aspects that have to be considered. And uh, then we will see the Rhine model will obviously interest uh, particularly, uh, um, obviously our uh, continental European students, Italian students and Belgian students, but also I think it interests uh, in comparison our British students because it gives you the, the idea we, we must understand, if we want to understand the development of capitalism in uh, England and in the US, we have to look at this, uh, at the role that uh, uh, unlimited uh, liability companies have played in these in these two uh, companies have played in these two uh, countries and seen instead what is the role of uh, companies in uh, in uh, continental European economic systems. It's very important. Both from a, obviously we are lawyers and we are interested in understanding the technicalities of how a company works, but obviously they have general. Um, general political and welfare uh, consequences. We shall see this very, when we look at the Rhine model, I will point out even this uh, specific predicament, what happens now with this dramatic uh, uh, economic crisis and what does this in mean from uh, a legal point of view and from an economic point of view in continental Europe and what are the differences between the consequences of coronavirus uh, crisis in continental Europe and in UK and US. But we shall see that uh, next, next week. I will, we will devote at least one or two lessons to, these, to this other model. Um, yellow, field, okay. Well, oh, business, uh, what, business endeavor is just a, 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 a very a generic indication of uh, economic activity. It could be a business, San Marco is asking, what exactly is a business endeavor? Just, it could be 
simply the, the fact that you you are opening a pizzeria and, and you need and you have and you want to and you need a company you want to separate your the risk of opening a pizzeria uh, you've opened it and you say well who knows if this pizzeria they're going to be clients people are going to come and what you do you create a uh, a limited liability company in order to separate the 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 the, the, the risk uh, of uh, the, the the failure of this activity from one's own personal asset. Just imagine that the owner of the pizzeria has a house, maybe he has a house in town, a house at the seaside. He has a car. He has a little bit of savings put aside. And, but he's afraid that maybe the, uh, his, the pizzeria is open, is going to not get to have success, and therefore creditors, all those who are, have given him money, the banks who have given him money to open the pizzeria, those who have uh, sold the machinery to make pizza, uh, will, uh, will go and, uh, and, and get his personal uh, uh, estate. So the idea is that in any business endeavor, the idea is that of separating the legal entity, the pizzeria, pizza, the pizza farcita, uh, limited liability company, pizza fichi, limited liability company, from the owner, Mr. Esposito, who's the owner of this pizzeria. So this is, uh, um, this is uh, the, the business endeavor. So just to show any economic activity. Uh, obviously, it's an endeavor because economic activity is never sure. I mean, if you are, if you have a castle and you live on a castle and you simply, you're a medieval lord and you're receiving uh, uh, taxes from the peasants, well, that's not an economic endeavor. You just, you live off, uh, of, of your the payment that you receive, uh, the payments you receive, while here we're talking of an economic activity which has a risk. What is the role? of uh, SEC, Yazevoli As. Uh, as I've mentioned, Security and Exchange Commission is an independent agency which is designated by the US President with the advice and consent of the, of the Senate, which must control that uh, most not only, it's not only the, the New York Stock Exchange because there are other markets on which uh, shares are um, are uh, exchanged, but they must control that those who enter this market follow certain rules. Now, this means that the Security and Exchange Commission has a very, very strong uh, regulatory role and sets the kind of rules through which uh, a company which wants to sell shares in the U.S. must uh, uh, abide with. Typical example, uh, a company, uh, let's say an Italian company wants to be uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. What does it mean listed? It means that people who want to buy the shares of that company can find those shares at the New York Stock Exchange. Why do you want to go to the New York Stock Exchange? Because why do you want to go to a big market and sell your products on a big market? Because there are more buyers. For the simple reason, if you go to a small market, there are few buyers. If you go to a big, big, big market like the New York Stock Exchange, you find lots of buyers. Now, if an Italian company wants to be listed at the New York Stock Exchange, it must follow not the Italian rules, but all the rules set by the U.S. law, and the law is immense on, on shareholder companies, but also by, set by the Security and Exchange Commission. So, for example, the the managers of the company must have certain qualifications. They must have they must have certain background. They must be competent. You must try to understand if there are conflicts of interest or not. So, it is a very screening. Each uh, uh, manager of a company, which is uh, designated as manager of a company which is listed, the New York Stock Exchange, the SEC will impose certain rules on saying, I want to be sure that the managers of these companies are competent, we do not have conflicts of interest. And also the kind of information that is provided. So any kind of information that 
is relevant for the market, it's market sensitive, must be provided. So the SEC is the model of the financial controller, financial market controller, and the model, this model is replicated and we find it in where it is the uh, financial um, uh, uh, services uh, um, agents, sorry, I'm trying to remember the, the English. What, what is the name of the English, uh, English uh, uh, institution that controls the, the, uh, the London stock market? Kidder Wood. You remember? It's the... FSA. Is it the London Stock Exchange Group? Yes, London Stock Exchange is under the control LSE, which is not is London Stock Exchange, is under the control the, of a financial institution, public financial institution, which is the financial uh, conduct authority, FCA. F C A Financial Conduct Authority. Yes. Financial Conduct Authority. So just to show, sorry, to my, every now and then you, uh, I forget the, and in Italy it's the CONSOB, which is the National Commission on, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Companies and on Stock Markets. In France it's COB, COB, uh, Commission uh, de la Bourse. And so it's just, uh, uh, so that model, the SEC is the model for most financial, public financial controllers, in, independent agencies that control financial markets and institutions. We are talking of financial markets because we control, we must control not only stock markets, we must also control other um, companies that operate on financial markets and play an important role. Investment funds, for example, or think of uh, uh, insurance companies and so on. So this is the role of the uh, a role of the SEC. Fundamental role because every now and then the SEC has been not closed an eye, has been rather relaxed and then certain things happened. The 2008 uh, dramatic crisis in the US financial crisis with the bankruptcy of the um, Lehman Brothers and with other important uh, US banks which had repercussions in the US and in the rest of the world well, this was due to the fact that the uh, Security Exchange Commission was somehow closing an eye and letting, leaving Lehman Brothers doing some rather, and other uh, financial institutions doing some very risky activities, so-called subprime uh, uh, lending and uh, subprime credit. And this brought to, finally brought to a, um, a dramatic um, financial crisis in 2008. Now, if there are no more questions, uh, we can close here uh, the today's lesson. And next week we will uh, we will uh, finish the Anglo-American model of uh, a company. We will look at the Rhine model. But I would also like to discuss, but I'll discuss it with you next week. I wouldn't mind. Uh, doing, this is mostly for our Italian students who are not uh, first year, they have to get accustomed also to uh, expressing themselves in English. I would like to do a test, uh, some kind of test, which is somehow simulates what the final exam might be. So just to, uh, just to get you prepared, to make you, I'm talking especially to our first year uh, Italian students, to get them more accustomed to, uh, the, first of all, we are obliged to do video lessons and therefore there's no direct contact with the class uh, um, presence and secondly I would like to so I'm not able to some quiz the students there are lots of students who are silent and so they might even not even speak one word of English I, I know it isn't like that but I, one could imagine that they are very fluent in Mandarin or very fluent in Portuguese but they don't know English uh, but I would like to sort of test them and sort of uh, to see that they sort of they get them prepared, better prepared for the exam when it will come to have, as the exam will be written, to have them uh, better prepared in this, uh, in this, under this aspect. So, but we will discuss this 
Uh, we will discuss this next week and we will devote some time of one of the lessons of next week's lessons to uh, specifically the uh, what, how to make this examination, uh, this final examination, how to get prepared for this examination. So uh, good afternoon to everybody and take care and uh, well with the uh, next uh, lessons of your uh, classes. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Good evening, see you next week. Goodbye.